Madonna is going to teach us the Bible. Yeah. Yay! So, and everybody's still awake? <laughs> um, you know, this isn't really my gift teaching, uh, but I'm doing it, so hold on. Um, <laughs> uh, I, hold on to each other, hold on to the floor, or whatever. Um, uh, not the fire, don't hold on to the fire. So I, um, I talk fast and loud, right, Millie? <laughs> um, and, um, uh, but for, well, first I want to welcome Vicki. Vicki, right? Vicki. Yes, Vicki. <laughs> yes. So this is uh, Beatrice and Mariella's mother. Yes. Mother. How about that? What did you say? Thank you. Yeah. Somebody's got to do it, you know, yeah. looking out for these moms, right? So welcome. I'm very glad to have you here from um, um, uh, Nashville, right? No. Is that right? No. Louisville, Kentucky, not Nashville, Louisville, Louisville. I knew it was warmer, and uh, yeah, so warmer than here, so welcome. So, okay, the, the title of my teaching is Let's Get Uncomfortable. Um, my first Bible study fellowship that I went to was in 1982. Um, I began to hear the Bible taught like I had never heard it before, except once in 1969 when I went to my friend's uh, Baptist church. So I was raised Catholic, and Mary Ellen and I have talked about this. For me to go to that Baptist church, my mother would not have approved. She did not know that I was going to this Wednesday night church service with my friend. And I don't think I even really knew I was going, but, you know, I was in the seventh grade, and I'm spending the night, and so we, so we go to this. To, you know, they go to church on Wednesday night, so we went to church. So um, it was a little church out, out in the middle of the country, and I grew up in the middle of nowhere, um, and this was even more in the middle of nowhere, and I, and I was in the seventh grade. So how old are you when you're in the seventh grade, like 12, 12 11, 12 something like that? Yeah. Um, so I, I thought that preacher was talking to me directly. Now, it wasn't a very big congregation, but I felt like he was talking to me and that moment really changed my life. Like I had, I had never heard the Bible taught like that before. Um, you know, growing up in the Catholic Church, the Bible. <laughs> it's so ironic to say this, but I'm looking at Mary Ellen because we talk about this a lot. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't teach the Bible. You know, the Catholic Church doesn't really teach the Bible. They, they sort of dance around it a little bit. But, but anyway, so I, I really, I thought, like I said, I thought that preacher was talking to me. But I didn't do anything about it for a long time because I, I was just a kid. You know, I was living at home and I didn't have a driver's license and I couldn't like take my pla myself places. So, um, but, but it really affected me. I thought that's, now that's the God that I want to know more about. And um, so I tell that story a lot because I think people need to hear it. You know, that preacher wasn't trying to convert me. Um, he might not even have known I was in the church. And I'm sure he didn't know what an impact his words had on me. I people have, and when I tell that story, people have said, "Did you ever tell him?" It's like, no, I never, I never told them. I never went back to to do that. But um, you know, he was just. But that preacher, um, his name was Klaus. Uh, they called him Doctor Klaus. I'm not sure he really was, but anyway, that's what they called him. Um, he was just living his life as one of God's peculiar people. Now, remember that word, peculiar people. He's, he was just one of God's peculiar people, just living his life, just doing, doing what he knew was the right thing to do as one of God's people. So then the next little story is, so on Thursday mornings, I go to a women's Bible study at a, at a local church in, in, um, near Northfield, in, in Winneka. Now, and I'm, and there's about 20 of us that go to that. I'm the only non-church member who attends. And so I definitely feel like an invited guest, and I feel like I need to be on my best behavior because I am an invited guest in, in their home. Um, so, um, so I, so, so I, I, you know, I, 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 I try to um, 
um, be on my best behavior. Let's just say that. <laughs> so recently, we were generally talking about our personal walks with God. And uh, one of the women there um, was talking about her job as a flight attendant. And she, she was saying that she prays for the, for the people on the plane. So she prays over them. And, and then, um, and she said, I've been doing that, you know, for years. But then I decided to start, I decided to start praying with them on the plane. And so, you know, she had kind of stepped up her walk there. You know, she went from just praying for them. They didn't know, you know, just anonymously. But, but then she would, she would point, you know, she would decide people on the plane that she was going to, you know, sit down next to him or kneel down next to him and pray for him. And, um, and another woman in, in, our, in our little fellowship there said, boy, I'm, I'm really not comfortable with that. And I thought, you know, I could just let that go or I could say something. You know, I could just let that go. But I thought that, that, uh, that original woman, the flight attendant, she was so bold in, in what she did and then also sharing it with the group. I thought, I'm not going I'm, I'm to let that go. So... Uh, Probably quicker than I should have, I said, <laughs> and maybe a little too loud, <laughs> we should be uncomfortable. <laughs> we need to be uncomfortable. I, and I went on to say a few other things about, you know, we need, to, we need to feel the urgency to talk to people about the word and, the, and, and that we've got the ability, we know, we know the words, we've got the ability to do it. And, and if it makes, it up, makes us uncomfortable, then let it be. Let us just be uncomfortable. And so then I quoted um, 1 Peter 2.9, um, in, which um, in the old King James, which of course that's, that's the Bible that I first learned, really learned the Bible, was the version was the old King James. So I still really love that, although I use new King James. Um, so for, um, 1 Peter 2.9 is it says you don't have to go there if you only if you really want to uh, but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation a peculiar people we're a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into this marvelous light so that's what that flight attendant was doing right you know she was she was stepping out and and showing forth the praises of him um, that you know she, that that has called her out of the darkness into the marvelous light, and and do but do we do we do that? Do we do that? Do we show forth praises of Him as 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 you know? I bet we do sometimes, but I bet there's times we could do it more, right? So um, there's two more times that the Bible says that we're peculiar, which I think that's such a cool word. You know, it's like who are you? Well, I'm a little peculiar. Oh, <laughs> this is this is in the notes. But so a lot of people know Barb um, um, Mulatto, right? Barb Mizo, Barb Mulatto Mizo. She's the one who introduced me to you. And, amen. So amen to that. So she, I've known her for a long time, and um, and we knew her brother even uh, from another situation, um, and so. Uh, this now has been almost probably 10 years ago. We ran into an, a, one of her, an, a different brother and his wife at a, an event in Winneka. And, um, and so I went up to her sister-in-law and I said, oh, well, we know, you, we know Barb and Jerry. And she, she said, oh, Barb and Jerry. Oh, they belong to that weird Bible study, that kind of cult thing where, you know, they don't they go to church like every night of the week and, and they're so into the Bible. You mean them? And I said, yeah. And, and I said, yeah, and we go to that same fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's really good. And I just smiled at her. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah, that's us. We go to that same fellowship. Uh, so, so anyway, peculiar people. Deuteronomy 14.2 calls us a peculiar people. For thou art a, a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a pe peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. And then in Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope the, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people. 
So, um, so what does it really mean to be peculiar, right? So, you know, as a Christian, um, um, when you just when you look at what we believe from a human standpoint, and we do sound a little peculiar, right? <laughs> so, um, we love one who we've, we've never seen. We talk every day ba- every day to someone we cannot see. We expect forgiveness of sin from by the virtue of another, by, by, by Jesus Christ, right? Mm-hmm. We empty ourselves in order to be full. We admit that we are wrong so we, we can be declared right. <laughs> we go down in order to get up. We are strongest when we're the weakest. We're richest when we're the poorest. We're happiest when we feel the worst. We die so we can live. And, and just go on and on. You know, this is mainly from the uh, epistles. So, so we could... Um, what it would be a good exercise to go through all all of this list and read these verses um, and and you'd even find more than that. But so um, you know, isn't it a liberating feeling to know that God is in control, right? Not us. Um, that hasn't always been easy for me to accept, and sometimes even now it's not always easy. That that word surrender. That really kind of still goes against my grade. It's like surrender. I'm not. I'm in control. But, but to surrender, to just, it's it's just a liberating feeling to know that God's in control. To just surrender, to surrender to to God. To just um, acquiesce, knowing that He's taking care of us. So, um, a, a song that I really like. I'm 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 sure that that um, we Sheila knows this one too. That I surrender all. Yeah, yeah. All to Jesus I surrender. You don't want me to sing. So, um, all to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him. In His presence daily live. I surrender all. To all Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, wholly Thine. Let me feel Thy Holy Spirit, truly knowing that Thou art mine. Um, so when we begin to surrender, um, that's when we really first start accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And it's a mistake to think that we can that we can receive um, Christ's sacrifice, um, and and but then go on living our lives any way we please. So from from that moment of, of commitment, God has made a claim on us, and we must ex, uh, expect Him. Um, we must expect him to tell us how to live, that, mm-hmm. that, that God is in control. We should never fear to give God complete control. And he loves us more than we love ourselves, and, mm-hmm. and, um, and, he, and his plan is, is um, the best plan. So what's holding us back? Um, well, we don't want people to think we're weird. Um, we well, don't. I, I already lost that. So <laughs> yeah, right. Sheila's already weird. Um, we don't want to be rejected. We don't. We don't think we know enough to share with others. I think that's a. That, I think that's a big stumbling block. Um, um, and we just. We might just be plain lazy. Um, so um, is it our, our or is it our own sin in our life that, that's holding us back? Um, you know, like we could be thinking, who are we to preach to others when we have our, have so much of our own sin? So think about, so just think about that. So um, C.S. Lewis said, isn't it, it is, it isn't that our desires are too strong, our desires are too weak. We are far too easily pleased. So that could be a whole nother teaching, right? Um so, so with all that, we um, we should ask for wisdom, right? Um, and and God's word promises that. James um, 1, 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to, the, to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Um, but to be convinced that God, but we need to be convinced that God's on our side, right? We, um, and how do we do that? Well, we do that by studying the word. Um, in uh, Romans 10, 8, it said, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. And then it goes on later. We are all very familiar with these. 
that if you confess your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then further down it says, um, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, with, who bring glad tidings of good things. This is actually, um, it's in Titus, or it's in Romans, but it's a um, quote from Isaiah. So we're all called to share the gospel message, right? But as soon as I point that, but as soon as I say that, I want to point out that um, it was Jesus's performance, not ours, right? Um, God, or Jesus paid the price, and it's our believing, not our achieving, right? The, the gospel message is our believing, even on our worst days of our humanly, our humanly performance, it doesn't change the reality that Jesus paid the price. Um, um, so, but to share the gospel, you need to know the word, right? Um, 2 Timothy 2.15, everybody say it together. <laughs> Study to show thyself approved for God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. Great, okay, great. So now you're all thinking, okay, Madonna, so how does this fit into my life? Um well, so I've got a little something to, to share here. <laughs> um, so, um, so, you know, to, to have time in the Word. So that's, that's my point, to have time in the Word. So um, Moses <laughs> went out for 40 days, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> what would happen if we left for 40 days? <laughs> Yeah, right. So Mrs. Moses, you know, Mrs. Moses, her, her name is um, Zephora, Zephora, Zephora. Um, uh, could she go leave for 40 days to go find God? No, no. Like, like, think about that. You know, now all of us, well, some of us, you know, have been busier with our family and our kids um, in the past more than what we currently are. Uh, so some of you, I, I'm sure you're thinking, there's no way I could go anywhere for, you know, a half hour, let alone 40 days. <laughs> and then um, and then the Apostle Paul spent three years out in the desert, um, basically alone, you know. Um, so, so I just want to read this a little bit. Um, it, okay. Um, have you ever noticed how in the scriptures men... <laughs> are always going up into the mountains to commune with the Lord. Now, this sounds like I'm, I'm going to start bashing men. I'm really not bashing men. Yeah. Yet, in the scriptures, we hardly ever hear women going to the mountains. But do you know why? Because the women are too busy keeping life going. They couldn't abandon babies, meals, homes, fires, gardens, and a thousand responsibilities to make the climb into the mountains. And, and, you know, we were just there. We were at the mountains. So, I mean, these are real mountains. Um, so I was talking to a friend that this, I didn't write this. I, this person says, I was talking to a friend the other day saying that it's as modern woman, as a modern woman, I feel like I'm never free enough for, of, for my responsibilities, never in a quiet enough space I, I want with God. And the response floored me. That's why, this is why God comes to women. So you all were kind of talking about that a little bit. Oh, that's my phone. Just ignore that. Um, that's why God comes to women. Men have to climb the mountain to meet God, but God comes to women wherever they are. I've been pondering these words, and, it, and, and, and I see that, that what she says is true. God indeed comes to women where they are, where, what, where they're doing their ordinary, everyday work, he meets them at the wells, right, um, where they draw the water in their homes, in their the kitchens, in the garden. He comes to them as they are, as they sit beside sick beds when they're giving birth, caring for the elderly, and perform necessary mourning and burial rites, even at the empty tomb. Mary was the first to witness Jesus' resurrect, uh, resurrection. Um, she was there because she was doing the woman, womanly chore, properly preparing Jesus' body. Um, uh, the, these women of the scriptures found themselves face to face with divinity. So if you've ever 
start to bemoan the fact that you don't have enough time to spend in the mountains with God as you would like, remember God comes to women. He knows where you are and the burdens we carry. He sees us. And if we open our eyes and our hearts, we will see him even in the most ordinary places, in the ordinary times. He lives. Amen. Oops. Um, so, um, um, so I just want to close here and, and um, with, a, with a little bit of, um, the, with a, just a, a little thought for to, to going forward in, in, um, in, our, in our spiritual lives here, to think about um, us as boots on the ground for God, right? <laughs> that we're like his special agent. Um, so that's the place that I want to dwell. That's what I want to be thinking about. And then, and then um, I, I saw this quote recently, and I just loved it. So uh, God let me be the sweet fragrance of you in a world that is getting more sour every day. Mm -hmm. So that's my teaching. That was wonderful.